Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, whose descendants became the new maritime nations in the various lands. And the sons of Ham were Cush, Put, Canaan, and Egypt. It is a matter of reckon that after leaving Egypt, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But even if this large group of people, who numbered in the thousands, advanced towards Jerusalem at just a single mile a day, they would have traveled along a path that was more than 14,000 miles long. Yet not a single trace of their wandering existence has ever been found within this region. No encampments, no beaten paths, no skeletal remains, no human waste, no war carnage, no validated structures, no graffiti, absolutely nothing. And for this reason, many no longer believe the stories of the Bible to be true. But they are. It is only the theories proposed in the 19th century and the actions they subsequently inspired in the 20th century that are wrong. But 21st century technology has dramatically changed the way in both the world and all of its historically important features can be viewed. To put this same 14,000 mile distance into yet another real world perspective, the people of Israel traveling just by land alone and at the same incredibly slow rate of just a single mile per day, could have easily traveled between the most southerly pyramid fields of Moreau and the most northerly pyramid fields of Giza, more than ten separate times. And even today, despite nearly a century of aggressive attempts to do so, no proven, untainted, or infallible evidence yet exists which confirms the declarations made by those untrained men in the 19th century as to the real-world location of the Exodus Road, Mount Sinai, Jerusalem, or Bethlehem, or any other critical point of historical interest to be either true, accurate, or precise in accordance with either the Judaic or the Gospel record. And in the absence of tangible evidence, only theories and untruths remain. And when untruths are spoken often enough, the unsuspecting eventually believe them to be true. In accordance with all eyewitness accounts, and as evidenced by the physical and the historical elements of that era, this is the real world story of Jesus in his earliest and his last years, including the true location of Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Jerusalem. This area was once covered by an ancient sea. Among the most poignant pieces of evidence attesting to this fact are the skeletal remains of whales long ago stranded as the water receded. While an array of petrified logs still lie on the side of a mountain where the one-time surf had washed them up and onto that ancient shore. And the numerous hulls of watercraft that are now found in so many high and dry far inland places. But on an even grander scale is the vast carpet of seashells which now serves as a timeless reminder of this once expansive sea, whose meandering and well-defined shoreline would later serve as an indelible boundary between certain divisions of land, since this once watery limit is easily distinguished from the elevated areas that lay above and beyond that ancient waterline, which the Phoenicians, the Philistines, Syrians, and Hebrews alike called the Negeb a geological term which literally means the dry land. But as the ancient sea receded, it left behind various bodies of water, each with its own unique characteristics and properties, such as the ebb and flow of the Euphrates tidal bore that once separated one continent from another, and the lake where Lot, whose uncle Abraham lived in nearby Hebron, once made both his home and his living, collecting, stockpiling, and selling the much sought after natron salts, or asphaltites, which had settled in this low and extensive soil. These highly valued minerals supplied the much sought after personal care products, such as soaps, toothpaste, and medicines, 
as well as also providing the catalyst needed to produce the world's first class products from the nearby silica sand. Ultimately making these salts and sands such a lucrative commodity that the vast stockpiles of these elements were continually being replenished. But when several of these commercial stockpiles were suddenly ignited by a direct hit from the legendary lightning bolt strike, the resulting sodium explosion completely destroyed the store cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, whose fiery end was marked by the fusion of a portion of these minerals into a single salt-like pillar that local legend would eventually attribute to Lot's own wife. Many years later, when Pausanias, an ancient traveler and historian, while on his way to view Solomon's temple in Egypt, walked among the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah, and was informed the water was so highly saturated with salt that it was impossible for a human body to sink, unless of course it was dead. And observing the water to be completely devoid of any form of aquatic life, and noting the fine death shrouds being woven from the flax plant, which grew along these same shores, and how the harvested salts were used to cleanse the body and to anoint the dead to prepare the corpses for mummification and for eventual burial, that this unique body of water, because of its many associations to lifelessness, death, and destruction, caused Pausanias to refer to this vast brew not as the Salt Sea, a lake asphaltitis, as it was commonly known, but instead he simply dubbed it the Dead Sea. Today the residual remains of this once expansive lake is known as Wadi Natron, while the rock tombs of nearby Hebron, where Abraham himself had settled, is now simply known as Lepsius No. 1. However, the greatest body of water to be left behind filled a crater-like depression that is geologically known as a Galil, whose surface area was of such a vast size that it naturally became known as the Sea of Galil, or otherwise as the Sea of Galilee. Today this unique body of salt-tainted water is known as the Fayum, a term which still literally means the sea. The surface level of the Sea of Galilee remained unchanged for a long period of time, since it was annually recharged by the dramatic and phenomenal return of the floodwaters they called the Jurhon, which over time, and in its transliterated form, became more commonly verbalized as the Jordan. However, the Tyrians, along with their brethren the Sidonians, had already established a clear presence within the highlands of this region during the initial ancient sea era which would later lead to the docking facility currently known as Kaiser Saga, being built on the shore of the Sea of Galilee to service the stone quarries owned and operated by the Sidonians on Mount Tabor, and who, after transporting the stone down the adjacent slope of Mount Carmel along the world's oldest paved road, loaded it onto barges and subsequently shipped it across the Sea of Galilee, where it was ultimately used to create the abundance of statuary, stelles, and pavements that are now found all along the Jordan River and in many other places throughout the ancient world. This was the lay of the land when Moses and the people of Israel streamed into the region on the east side of the Jordan to take with brutal force the land settled by Lot's two displaced sons Moab and Ammon, who because of the incestuous relationships Lot had with his two daughters were also his two grandsons. But after Moses had conquered the domains of Moab and Ammon, the people of Israel still continued to surge northward with their brutal campaign, launching attacks against the Philistines and the Syrian people, whose few surviving members fled even further northward to escape the onslaught. Then, just before his death on Pisgah Peak, Moses divided all the land they had just taken by force, and he gave it all to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and to half of the people belonging to the tribe of Joseph's son, Manasseh, before declaring Joshua, who is otherwise known to Egyptologists as Meremptah, to be the new leader over all the people of Israel. And then Moses died. After his death, Moses' mummified body was transported to the base of Mount Hor, where it was interred in the royal cemetery in the region of their former dwelling place, which is currently known as the Valley of the Kings where the first commemorative mention of the nation of Israel can still be found written in stone. Soon after Moses' interment, 
Joshua summoned all the war-worthy men to Gilead, including those from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, even though Moses had already given them the land on the east side of the Jordan River. Still, he prepared the armies of every tribe for crossing over to the west bank of the Jordan and into the so-called Promised Land. But at that very same time, the annual floodwaters of the Jerhon were once again beginning to flow into the valley. And so the Canaanites, living on the west bank of the Jordan, let down their guard, since no army could ever achieve crossing against such a deep and swiftly moving current. However, because the people of Israel had lived all their lives along the Jordan, as well as having journeyed along its entire length since departing from the southern land of Egypt, they were not only intimately aware of when the annual Jerhon floodwaters would arrive, but even more importantly, having traveled along the entire length of the river, they were also aware of the means, the methods, and the very place where the Jerhon floodwaters could be successfully contained, albeit briefly, and to that end they had strategically prepared a dam further upstream to reduce the flow of water at the most opportune time. And so with the rising floodwaters beginning to fill the valley, and because the Canaanites had let down their guard, the dam was closed, and the floodwaters suddenly began to drop. In disbelief, the bewildered Canaanites watched helplessly as the entire Israeli army, with the symbolic Ark of the Covenant, the tangible symbol of their pledge to reach the so-called Promised Land, leading the way at the head of the column, as the army of Israel wound their way toward them along the meandering ridgeline of the Jabbok Ford, until they arrived on the west bank and entered into Jericho at Gilgal. The vastly outnumbered and bewildered Canaanites ran in panic, taking refuge within the decrepit walls of ancient Jericho, where they could only watch in fright, as the seasoned army of Israel swarmed around their antiquated compound, and in such great numbers that the fragile stones began to shift, only to finally fall, and no one inside the walls of Jericho ever escaped their wrath. After witnessing the rampant pillaging by the men of Israel, Joshua reissued the order requiring every soldier who had not yet undergone the procedure to be circumcised to prevent an epidemic of transmitted diseases from destroying the might of his militia. A ritualistic initiation still memorialized just beyond the ruined walls of Jericho, where one of the earliest examples of Semitic writing was also found, along with a commemorative copy of the Ten Commandments Moses had placed in the Ark of the Covenant at Mount Sinai at the outset of the Exodus. As the people of Israel expanded their insurgency into the outlying area, a contingent of spokesmen, hoping to gain early favor with Joshua, arrived at Gilgal from a nearby village and provided him with strategic information as to the whereabouts of a neighboring community who were planning to attack his troops. As a result, Joshua's army left Gilgal and then a surprise attack invaded Gibeon. And just as they were chasing down the last of the fleeing refugees, the day went totally black in one of the rarest celestial events ever recorded. As the moon moved in front of the sun to produce the total eclipse of December 20th, 1246 BCE, at the precise moment of the year when the sun reaches its lowest point in the sky and for just a few brief moments stands completely still, before it begins to move backwards to return from whence it came. This celestial phenomenon is known as the solstice. It is an astronomical term that literally means to stand still. A celestial event so rare, and with the dark actions of their surprise attack so complete, that they recorded the following condoning passage in both the book of Joshua and the book of Jesha. On the day the Lord delivered the Amorites to the children of Israel, he said, Son, stand still at Gibeon. And the sun stood still in the midst of the heavens. And it stood still six and thirty moments. And the moon also stood still. And it also stopped. While Joshua took vengeance on the nation of his enemy. With his hardened and experienced army, Joshua continued his attacks on the Canaanites for several years, a docile plainspeople who were ill-prepared for warfare, 
unlike the Amalekites of the south, or the tenacious Philistines and their Syrian neighbors, who had condensed themselves into the northwest regions. For this reason, Joshua had not achieved full control over the entire West Bank. But even so, because they had fulfilled their obligations, Joshua allowed the men from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh to return to their conquered land on the east side of the Jordan, while the other nine and a half tribes remained on the West Bank, each of whom, knowing Joshua's health was in steep decline, were now demanding him to divide the land amongst them, and in large portions, with each section being assigned to a particular tribe, just as they had been promised, and just as Moses had done for their brethren on the opposite side of the river. So in his last official act, in an effort to appease the tribes, Joshua sent surveyors out to map the entire region, including those regions he had not yet conquered. So he divided the land into parcels, based not on size, but rather on the sum value of its inherent resources. And as a result, and in some cases by using the easily defined shoreline of the ancient sea as a specific boundary line, the parcels of unequal size extended far into the regions not yet conquered, just as they had asked them to do. And for this reason, on the verge of death, and with the full might of his army now diminished, Joshua declared that each tribe was now independently responsible for acquiring the land he had allotted to them, and for making it their own. And then Joshua died, leaving the people of Israel, who are alternately known as the people of Egypt, the Habarus, or Hebrews, Judeans, or Jews, for the first time since leaving Goshen at the outset of the Exodus, without a central leader to control their actions. And so disputes and disunity began to develop between the tribes once again, as each independent tribe vied with one another while in pursuit of their own land claims. Over the next 1,000 years, 4,000 generations would come and go, and many societal, geographic, and physical world changes were to take place. But the disunity caused by Joshua's death had never been resolved over the course of those particular 10 centuries. So the power and influence the people of Israel had once wielded as a single force was no longer feared, and they had now become the hunted. To rectify this situation, Saul, who was otherwise known to Egyptologists as Huni and to Herodotus as Proteus, became their first appointed king. And he began the process of reuniting the tribes by accepting the military challenge to clear a path down to Mount Hor, to connect their former southern domicile with the northern section, with the intention of re-establishing a sense of solidarity among the tribes. But then David of Bethlehem slew Goliath the Philistine, and upon Saul's untimely death, David became the second king over all the people of Israel. And under his guidance, David, who was otherwise known to Egyptologists as Snephru, but to Herodotus as Ramsonitis, succeeded in organizing the tribes into a formidable coalition, which he ruled from the city he established on the slopes of Mount Zion where he immediately began to make preparations to build a magnificent memorial structure as a testament to their maritime heritage, just as Noah had intended his son and their common ancestor Shem to do. But David was never able to achieve this elusive goal in his lifetime either. But instead, he left the entire task of building the temple complex to his son Solomon, who was otherwise known to Egyptologists as Kafu and to Herodotus as Sheops, and who spent the greater portion of his life building the massive structure and the adjoining temple complex just to the north of the city of David. Then when Solomon died, a feud immediately developed between his two sons over how the kingdom should be managed. And so the tribe splintered yet again, with one alliance becoming known as the Judeans, while the remaining tribes, to differentiate their domain from that of the Judeans, and whose alliance was centrally situated in and around Jacob's well, became fittingly referred to as the District of Israel, since this was where young Jacob had taken refuge while escaping his brother Esau's wrath. 
but who changed his name from Jacob to Israel when he returned to this area years later. As a result of this feud, the Hebrews no longer had one king, but now they had two. And as a consequence of this split, and because of the looted wealth they had accumulated over the course of their many brutal campaigns, and the enemies they had made in doing so, each domain was now independently susceptible to an attack from any one of the outside forces they had formerly antagonized, and who were now more than eager to take advantage of the opportunity to invade and to conquer. And so it was not long before Israel's seat of government was invaded by the Assyrians, who took all those who lived around Jacob's well captive and led them away, and who were then replaced by a garrison of Assyrians who renamed the place Samaria. And in like manner, so too was Mount Zion invaded, sacked, and totally lost to the Babylonians, who also led the entire population of Jerusalem away. But before they departed, the Babylonian army made great efforts to desecrate the Temple Memorial, robbing it of its riches and leaving the entire area in a most unimaginable ruinous state. As a result of these many varied chaotic shifts in power, disputes, invasions, and desecrations, great portions of the past and present history of both Judea and Israel were becoming increasingly muddled and less understood. However, seventy years and several generations later, with a change of Babylonian leadership, Cyrus the Great, the king of Babylon, allowed the exiles to return to the banks of the Jordan River, but not all of the Judeans chose to make the journey, since most of the original group had died, while many of them did not choose to go since they had never actually seen the celestial-based monument Solomon built as a testimonial to their maritime heritage, and were no longer inspired to do so, even though it marked with precision the whereabouts of Eden, the one-time island home of Adam and Eve, whose sinking Noah had escaped in antiquity, but for those who did return, and had actually seen the memorial monument in all its glory, but now as old men and old women, looked upon the desecration it had suffered, were overcome with the greatest of sorrow. Because above all else, it was exactly where the promise to preserve their entire history had finally been achieved. And it was exactly why, with its completion, they called this geodetic marker, this navel of the earth, Jerusalem, a term which means the place of fulfillment and a final rest. But the sudden return of the former exiles was met with hostile resistance by the people who had filtered into Jerusalem after it had been swept clean of the Judeans seventy years before. So in fear for their lives, especially in light of their own past deeds, and having been completely stripped of their military might, the exiles had no choice but to stay on the east side of the Jordan River, where they set up their city of tents directly across from Jerusalem, where the towering monument could be plainly seen. And because each and every one of them had lived in Babylon proper for so long, with most of them having been born and raised there, they had naturally acquired many of the Babylonian traits, customs, and mannerisms, and so the fortified heights where the exiles had settled on the east side of the Jordan River was dubbed Babylon. But as soon as he heard of their endangered plight, Cyrus acted swiftly and enforced his own decree by threatening to retaliate against anyone who interfered with the exile's mission to rebuild Jerusalem. Nevertheless, at first there were only a very few who dared to leave the safety of so-called Babylon. But as more and more of them began to migrate back into Jerusalem, an ambitious plan was concocted to build a brand new monument, in part to symbolize the rebirth of their community, just as Cyrus had wished them to do. And as their most prominent benefactor also went further by pledging the funds they would need to replicate the original monument his predecessor had so badly desecrated and defiled. Despite Cyrus's decree, the former exiles still continued to face great resistance from the local population, whose political interference was tenacious and unending. As a result, after the construction of the second monument had been underway for quite some time, 
it came to an abrupt stop, to allow Cyrus time to reconsider his decision. But only after a great period of time had passed was the work finally allowed to resume. However, the materials, building methods, and workmen were very different. But even so, the structure began to rise higher once again. Then Cyrus the Great, their magnanimous benefactor, died. And seizing upon the opportunity to renew their protest with the new ruler of Babylon proper, the local population succeeded in having construction on the second monument stopped yet again until further considerations could be made. Eventually, the new king of Babylon proper, after completing his own deliberations, allowed the work previously sanctioned by Cyrus the Great to resume. But as a precaution, he sent Ezra the scribe to Judea to write down all he saw and all he heard, so that he could stay constantly informed of both the progressive activities as well as the temperament of the people. And Ezra did exactly that, conducting his literary affairs on the east bank of the Jordan in the hills of so-called Babylon, where he, along with his school of scribes and his contingent of interpreters, were constantly engaged in gathering up and recording the information for posterity. As a result, in 1896, more than 200,000 ancient scrolls and hundreds of manuscripts were inadvertently discovered in the district of so-called Babylon, where they had been hidden away in a specialized secret vault called a Genizah. This massive collection of scrolls, found in old Cairo, was the source from which the comparatively minuscule collection of so-called Dead Sea Scrolls that was serendipitously discovered in the stock and isolated region of the Qumran Caves in 1946 had been taken. They are exactly the same. In his enterprise to present an accurate record, Ezra the scribe wrote the following regarding the building of Solomon's Temple. In Lebanon alone, work was carried out by 10,000 men who worked in three-month shifts. The structure was built from blocks of high-grade stone cut to size and smoothed on both their inner and outer faces, and the temple was finished at the end of 20 years. While in comparison, Herodotus, the Greek adventurer historian, who was in so-called Babylon, our old Cairo, near the end of Ezra's life, and who interacted on a scholarly level with the former exiles, wrote the following to describe the same geometrically inclined monument. Work was carried out by a hundred thousand men who worked in three-month shifts to build the pyramid with stone smoothed and fitted together in the most perfect manner. And the pyramid was finished at the end of twenty years. But the incessant political pressures continued unabated, causing the work on the second monument to be halted once again. However, Ezra's report served to console the Babylonian kingship, and so the Judeans, along with their counterpart brethren from the divided tribes of Israel, were finally given permission to resume work on the second monument Cyrus the Great had commissioned so many years before. But even so, by this time the materials, the building methods, and the skills of the workmen were again no longer the same, and as a result, the second monument, in its finished state, never equaled the fine craftsmanship displayed in the first monument built by Solomon. Today the signs of these stoppages are clearly evident in both the layers and the quality of stone used to construct the second monument, whose surrounding walls still display Nehemiah's tribute to their repair. When news of these pyramid builders, who told a gripping story of how a single family had sailed away from their ancestral home just before it had sunk into the ocean, and who had also survived the ensuing tsunami of legendary proportion, and of their gods and kings and of maritime men whose knowledge of the world's oceans, and their ability to draw maps of both the earth and the sky, was carried back to Greece, it caused a sensation of discussion, thought, and intrigue among the many scholarly institutions located there. Among those who were the most inspired by these reports were Plato, 
and his student Aristotle, who also shared the same passion for investigating all things of a mysterious nature, as did Aristotle's most distinguished and fearless student, the very young but extremely adept Alexander the Great. And together the trio left Athens and entered into so-called Egypt for the sole purpose of launching a full-scale scientific inquiry to discover for themselves just who these great builders were, where they had come from, and most especially, just what had inspired their enterprise, both humanly as well as divinely. To that end, the elder Plato, along with his protege Aristotle, became particularly obsessed to learn more about the doctrines of Moses, since it was his image and his name that was continually found all along the Jordan. And for this endeavor, in order to gather all the information into a single place so it could be properly assessed and studied, Plato and Aristotle conspired to build a repository on the east bank of the Jordan River, and near to Kadesh, situated directly across from Mount Hor, where Moses had spent a great portion of his administrative life, and where his mummified remains had been interred in the royal cemetery nearly 1,000 years before. In the meantime, young Alexander, along with his youthful army, roamed throughout Egypt, passing through Jerusalem, visiting Mount Sinai, and then moving on to the Pyramids of Moreau, before journeying deep into the desert regions of the Red Sea, and then sailing off to Mount Ararat, where it is a matter of reckon that he viewed the remains of Noah's Ark, before moving on to the land of Shinar in the Indus River Valley in their scientific quest to collect any information concerning the intriguing heritage of this ancient culture. And in every case of discovery, sending the collected material and information back to the repository, and in such great quantities, that Plato and Aristotle, in thankful tribute to their young benefactor and partner, acknowledged these magnificent contributions by having Alexander's image carved into the stone of their new repository which became known as the Library of Alexandria. Today the entire district where this legendary structure is situated is still referred to as Thebes, a name Plato and Aristotle bestowed on it in recognition of Thebes, Greece, Alexander's birthplace. But in his endeavors Alexander heard that a magnificent trove of scrolls and manuscripts are rumored to be hidden in a secret vault located across the river from Jerusalem, in the region of so-called Babylon. But were in immediate peril of being lost to a group of robbers who were aggressively looting in the area. So he immediately set out. And with a small yet elite contingent of men, Alexander moved swiftly, and quickly arrived in the region of so-called Babylon. But as Alexander led his men over a wall, in his attempt to rout the would-be robbers, he was suddenly ambushed from above. A single arrow entered his shoulder and pierced downward, slicing deep into his body. His terrified men reacted by breaking off the feathered end and by pushing the remaining portion of the shaft further down until someone could reach up and through the crude incision they had cut into Alexander's lower side, so the arrow could be gripped and pulled through. But by now the damage was too severe and the injury too complex. And with the robbers routed, the young men transported Alexander across the river to Jerusalem, where the best practitioners were located. But it was of no use. With the pain and the injury so severe, his men sorrowfully granted Alexander the first of his two final wishes. And out of mercy and respect, they helped him take his own life in a most peaceful way. Several months later, the mummified body of Alexander was placed into a golden coffin and finally laid to rest, just as he had requested, next to Moses, in the Valley of the Kings, on Mount Hor, directly across from the library which bore his Grecian name. Today, Alexander the Great is just as famously known by his adopted Egyptian name, Tutankhamun. For the next 300 years following Alexander's untimely death, 20 generations would come and go, 
and in that time many natural and political changes would take place yet again. And for this reason, many more historical important elements would also be eventually lost, destroyed, or simply forgotten. The Library of Alexandria, filled with artifacts, maps, and fragile manuscripts of every type, and on every subject, collected during and after Alexander's lifetime, would be lost in a fire as they were being moved to a new repository, located just downstream from the Library of Alexandria, which the Greek philanthropist Cleopatra, along with her Roman benefactor, Mark Antony, had conspired to build at nearby Dendera, where the soot attesting to this monumental loss is still in evidence today. But as 300 years of both the good and the bad Greek influences was drawing to an end, the Romans, in their never-ending quest to reap the benefits of the resources new territories had to offer, continued to stream into so-called Egypt, in even greater numbers on ships of enormous size, where they immediately began to meddle in the affairs of the Hebrew communities, who again were engaged in civil strife with one another. As a result, the Romans, looking to supplement their own military might in this foreign land, craftily took advantage of the political turmoil. And so they aligned themselves with a ready-made army of raiders, whose leader, a brutal mercenary, whose lust for power, along with his egotistical and self-serving interests, to surpass the building achievements of the former kings in order to promote his own personal legacy, was their perfect choice especially since this individual was not a thoroughbred Jew, and was known as a man who had no true allegiances to anyone but himself. So with their military might mounting by the day, the Romans declared Herod to be the new king of the Jews, and it became a convenient and a deadly alliance. Herod ruled with a brute force he never hesitated to use, and at first, Along with the equally brutal forces of the Roman army backing his newfound enterprise, Herod drove the last of the Greek military out of Jerusalem, and soon thereafter began his own quest to build and to expand on structures all throughout the area. Among the first was the stronghold of Masada, a refuge he both restored and enlarged near to his colonized Idumean home, a fortress he designed to withstand a very long siege since he trusted no one. While on the opposite side of the river valley, in the region of so-called Babylon, he built with Roman support the fortified stronghold of Machaerus, since each location provided him with not only a direct sight line to Jerusalem, but even more importantly, they provided him with several direct escape routes leading away from the towering monuments, since as an ally of the brutal Romans, and always wary of everyone and everything, Herod had easily become a widely targeted man. But by now the Romans had been exerting their unwanted influences throughout the region and along the entire length of the Jordan River for more than 60 years. At first besieging Jerusalem where Pompey had profaned the first monument built by Solomon, when he unsanctimoniously entered into its hallowed interior, and where Herod, empowered by the Romans to do so, ordered the reluctant population to begin adding more height and a new stone casing to the already towering pinnacle of the second structure, simply because their ancestors had failed to achieve the same greatness and quality as the first monument built by Solomon, and it would prove to be a most punishing task. But in the period leading up to the death of Alexander the Great, numerous physical and societal changes had been taking place. The flow of water into the Sea of Galilee had been curtailed by both nature and by man, and new docking facilities and townships, particular to that pre-Roman era, had sprung up all along the shoreline, as the Greeks of that previous era had also continued to expand their academic presence all along the Jordan River. And who would? in the spirit of Plato, Aristotle, and Alexander, subsequently coordinate, transcribe, and publish under Ptolemy Philadelphus, the recollections of 72 selected Hebrew historians, whose remembrances of their past were written on a certain type of papyrus called Byblos, 
and subsequently compiled into a single manuscript, more popularly known today as the Old Testament. The condensed historical account of how and why the temple complex and the massive monumental structures situated on the slopes of Mount Zion had come to be built, and by whom. In recognition of his enterprise to rescue their tumultuous and fractured history from oblivion, the Judean community honored Ptolemy in a very special way, by engraving their tribute to him on a commemorative tablet that is more popularly known today as the Rosetta Stone, which was found just downstream from the numerous geometrical structures the Greeks simply referred to as the pyramids. In the meantime, just as the docking facility at the base of Mount Tabor had grown silent, so too were the docks and harbors established in the Grecian era left just as high and dry as the Sea of Galilee continued to shrink in size, just as the Dead Sea and the Euphrates Tidal Bore also continued to do. But even though they no longer received the merchant ships as they once did, these former harbor points still served the caravans who came for the bountiful produce and timber the ever-expanding and enriched soil yielded in abundance. And with the gradual change of both the shoreline and the diversity of the increasing population who lived there, new townships, villages, and regions, each one with their own distinct allegiances and ideals, continually came into existence. But even after more than 1,000 years of transitioning, the Sea of Galilee was still a most formidable body of water, along whose fertile shores fishermen still cast their nets from sturdy boats, built for them by the skilled carpenters who lived at the edge of the forest, along a very particular inland waterway, where all things nautical could be obtained, at a place they called Nazareth. But the working population of Galilee had grown weary of the constant intimidation the ever-increasing demands, and the brutality of the Romans who had infiltrated every community center, aided by Herod who himself had grown more powerful, more feared, and more emboldened with each passing year. And as the ranks of the Roman army continued to grow in size, so too had their personal needs, and to meet this demand the Romans imposed quotas on the labor force, who were required to supply them, and at no cost, with whatever goods they needed. It was extortion without an end, since the laborers would be working to supply, and therefore to keep in power, the very people who were oppressing them. It made no sense at all. And no area was more affected by this unjust form of tax than the industrious people who lived in the bountiful region of Galilee, where their catch of fresh fish, harvested produce, and manufactured items were garnered on a daily basis. But upon hearing the working class in Galilee were growing increasingly resentful of the quotas being imposed on them, Quirinius, the Roman governor of both Judea and neighboring Syria, ordered a census be conducted throughout the entire land, so each society's affiliations, allegiances, unions, associations, and skills could be assessed. But most importantly, he wanted to know exactly how many able-bodied men he might be up against so he could prepare to meet any uprising, any place, at any time, with an overwhelming force. Under threat of a sure and severe punishment if they didn't comply with the census, Joseph left Nazareth in Galilee, and along with Mary, who was with child, traveled back to Bethlehem, his ancestral home, to register his genealogy in accordance with the terms of the census. But soon after officially recording and registering his ancestry with the census takers, Mary gave birth to the child they called Jesus, who was born with a most rare countenance that was completely unlike their own. Word of his unusual physical appearance spread rapidly amongst the oppressed and dejected people, who had also crowded into the country town to be counted, each of whom had also been wishing for a sign of hope. And here was suddenly a baby boy, born as milky white as Noah, the famous mariner who had escaped from the cataclysmic event of an unprecedented proportion. And this was Bethlehem, the exact same town where David had been born. 
a mere shepherd boy who killed Goliath, and had then risen on his own merits to become the first full king of the Jews, and who had then steadfastly prepared his own son Solomon for the task of building the towering monument in Jerusalem as a navel of the earth, to serve as a lasting and eternal testament to their maritime past, heritage, and their understanding of both celestial mechanics and worldwide navigation. And all of these were Jesus' ancestors. And this was their first sign. Joseph remained in Bethlehem to be sure Mary and the infant Jesus would be hardy enough to make the three-day journey back to Nazareth. In the meantime, news of Jesus' appearance and his ancestral lineage continued to spread and caused a commotion wherever it was heard. Among those who witnessed these excited gatherings and became intrigued by the news were merchant seamen from another land, accomplished navigators each and every one, and who by carefully measuring between the moon and a very particular star, which stood alone at the apex of the great circle of equal altitude ingeniously devised by Enoch, then used by his grandson Noah, and which now guided their own vessel across the sea, and had led them directly to Jerusalem, just as it had always done. Merchant seamen who, because of their profound and accomplished ability to navigate by the moon, the stars, and the sun, and who easily read the signs of the zodiac, as they sailed the oceans of the world, were considered to be, and were thusly called, wise men. After conducting their business affairs with Herod, whose harbors teemed with merchant ships from every land, and whose commerce he controlled, the wise men were quite interested in seeing the newborn infant for themselves, especially since they too sailed their own ships along the same navigational baseline his own ancestor Noah had used, and ultimately memorialized in such a dramatic and monumental way. For this reason, the wise men asked for directions to the town of Bethlehem, and Herod, after listening intently to their odd request, and in further consideration of the widespread commotion the birth of this particular baby was causing, issued an order that all newborn males in and around the town of Bethlehem be destroyed. The wise men arrived in Bethlehem and brought with them the news of Herod's order, causing instant panic among the many families gathered there. Since the brutality of Herod and his desire to remain in power at any cost was well known to everyone, since he had already publicly killed many of his own family members whenever he felt threatened by them. For this reason, the women in and around Bethlehem banded together and along with their young sons headed northward and away from Herod's advancing men, who operated out of Jerusalem. However, soon after leaving Bethlehem, Mary split it off from the group, and she turned westward, continuing on while many of the others lagged behind, and stopped to rest at Marimda Beti Salama, with the expectation of finding refuge there. But it was not to be so. When Herod's mercenaries caught up with them, they slaughtered every mother and son, whose burials are still there to this day. Joseph reunited with Mary and Jesus at Alhamra, the unique fresh water spring located at the edge of the Salt Sea. But because they knew Jesus' rare countenance would not show up among the dead children, they also knew they would still be hunted by Herod's mercenary troops. So Joseph took Mary and Jesus, and under cloak, moving stealthily, the trio made a wide berth around Jerusalem, traveling through the wilderness, before arriving at El Matareya, where many of Joseph's relatives still lived, and who were descendants of those who had come out of Babylon proper several hundred years before, and where he, Mary, and Jesus were taken in and hidden away. But as a carpenter from Nazareth, skilled with boats and boat building, Joseph soon found suitable transport. And so the family of three fled the area and traveled deep into Egypt to where the Valley of Sida, a community of highly skilled carpenters dedicated to building specialized river and ocean-worthy watercraft was located just across from the Valley of the Kings, where the body of Moses was interred in his former domicile and where the stele commemorating the conquests of Joshua and the first written mention of Israel was dedicated. 
and it was here, in the province of Kadesh, where the parts of those great ships were manufactured and then subsequently carried overland along the Wadi Hammamat watershed, where they would be reassembled into the great ships outfitted at Kusea, before departing to travel about all of the world's oceans to collect as well as to dispense all forms of societal, scientific, and navigational information. But even more importantly, Jesus' new home was also situated right between the two great academic centers of the scholarly libraries of Grecian Alexandria and Greco-Roman Dendera, each of which was renowned as a mapmaker's paradise, where all worldly and astronomical matters, both human and divine, were still being gathered together, compiled, compared, and studied with a vibrant and an unrivaled intensity. Four years later, Joseph received the news of Herod's death, but he chose not to return to his former domicile, because after the Romans had made him the king of the Jews, Herod had immediately broken with tradition, and he had replaced the descendant priests, men who had always inherited their position, with men of his own choosing, and it became a corrupt and an unholy alliance. These were the conspiring men Joseph was now most wary of, because not only had they grown wealthy, but they had become addicted to the power and the influence bestowed on them by both Herod and the Roman politicians. However, when Joseph finally felt enough time had passed, and with several new children born while they were away, he set out for home. But by now, Jesus had lived in this historically, theologically rich environment for eleven formative and impressionable years during which time, because of his extraordinary countenance and his remarkable ability to retain all that his inquisitive mind observed, he had easily befriended the scholars, who still lived all around the nearby libraries, and who conversed with him on so many varied things, both human and divine. It was nearing springtime when Joseph arrived back in the area with the intention of settling near his relatives in the district of so-called Babylon. But after learning the Romans had made Herod's son Archelaus, the new figurehead king of the Jews, Joseph immediately changed his plans, and he took his family back to the sloping banks of the Nazareth instead. But even so, since they had been away from the area for such a long time, and still yearning to reunite with their northern friends and relatives, Joseph took Mary, Jesus and Jesus' brothers and sisters on a journey to Jerusalem to partake in the annual Passover celebration in remembrance of the Exodus when Moses had led the people of Israel out of Egypt's land and through the Red Sea in their quest to return to the so-called Promised Land. But on the way to Jerusalem, Joseph took Jesus to Simeon, a very old priest whom he still trusted, and being schooled in the ancient prophecies, Simeon immediately recognized Jesus' extraordinary countenance, and so he blessed him in a very special way. When Joseph and Mary arrived in Jerusalem, they made camp with their relatives whom they hadn't seen for twelve years. But because Jesus was on the verge of manhood, and was so astute in academic matters and learning, and so experienced in travel and worldly matters, they allowed him to roam under cover among the crowds but always in the protective company of a relative, so he could experience all the sights and the sounds Jerusalem had to offer. And with each passing day, Joseph and Mary got used to not seeing Jesus, since he was always out and about, which was not at all uncommon. However, believing he was still in the protective company of a relative, Joseph and Mary left for home, with the expectation that Jesus would follow along shortly thereafter. But when they realized Jesus was no longer with their relative, they rushed back to Jerusalem, where they found him, with his extraordinarily different countenance in full display, conversing and lecturing the priests and visiting scholars, who always congregated at the base of the temple monument built by Solomon. It was a captive audience whom Jesus had informed, along with so many other things of academic and genealogical intrigue, that Solomon was just one of the many famous fathers he was directly related to. Joseph and Mary were frightened by the dire prospects of Jesus' very public appearance, something they had always gone to such great lengths to prevent, since it was only twelve years earlier that Herod the Great had ordered his murder, and the Roman soldiers, 
his contingent of corrupted priests, the Herodians, and all of their crafty agents were everywhere, prowling through the crowds, a fact which only caused Joseph even greater concern, because many of the men who had gathered around Jesus raised a boisterous protest as he led the young man away. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus left Jerusalem and swiftly returned to Nazareth, where Jesus explained to them how inspired he had become by finally seeing the soaring monument his many fathers had had a hand in building, and their resolve to memorialize their maritime heritage. But after listening to the sincerity in his voice and seeing the light in his eyes, it did little to console Joseph and Mary, who were saddened knowing there was only one thing they could do in a great hurry to both protect him and to fulfill his most desired request. And shortly thereafter, Jesus disappeared. Eighteen years later, Jesus returned to Nazareth, where Mary still lived along with his four brothers and his several sisters, some of whom he had never even met. But in his maturity, his unique countenance had dramatically enhanced his physical appearance, and there were some in Nazareth who were frightened by his presence, but yet it caused anyone who saw him not to look away. But Jesus soon discovered the despair in Galilee had not abated, even though in his long absence Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, was no longer king of the Jews, but had been replaced by his brother Antipas, who was now the figurehead ruler of Galilee where serious talk of a revolution was brewing among the new generation of laborers, who, unlike their parents, were unafraid of the consequences they might suffer at the hands of the Romans, since they had nothing much to lose. And for this reason Antipas also took up residence in his father's former citadel, as he too had grown afraid to visit Galilee. But to reach a higher level of understanding of these matters, Jesus left Nazareth and set out for Jerusalem, where he came upon the son of his mother's good friend, a bear of a man of his exact same age, who in full view of the massive memorial structures, was using the floodwaters of the Jordan just as they began to rise, as a symbolic means of conveying a reminder for the consequences of living a corrupted life, just as the floodwaters that had washed away all the corrupted people in Noah's day. But despite John's kind-hearted and robust lovable manner, it was a harsh baptism, as he plunged each and every pledge into the water and held them there until the last of the bubbles had disappeared. And when he finally brought them gasping to the surface, they truly understood how great a gift they had been given. It was a rebirth, a new mindset, a new realization of a greater power, and the appreciation of life itself. A time to speak out against tyranny and to uphold the dignity of life no matter what the personal cost may be. So John took Jesus, whose physical appearance had so captivated him as well, and in full view of the temple monument, he plunged him into the flood waters of the Jordan on the shores of Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus confirmed his pledge to create a new beginning. Soon thereafter, Jesus went off by himself into the Judean wasteland where for forty days he reflected on all of his life experiences, and those of others as well, just as John had meant for him to do. When Jesus returned to Jerusalem, he climbed to the top of Solomon's temple, where he stood upright and balanced against the lunar winds, with the whole world at his feet, and for one brief moment he silently wondered to himself just what would happen if he were to suddenly cast himself down from the top of that great height. But Jesus descended downward into the vastly troubled realm of Jerusalem, and as he made his way back towards Nazareth, he both startled and captivated all he greeted in salutation. But upon reaching Jacob's well in Samaria, Jesus received the news that Antipas, simply to satisfy his lust for a young woman, had arrested his friend and confidant, John the Baptist. But Antipas, fearing the people would riot at the news of John's arrest, since the robust, kind-hearted, and lovable John was so well-known and so well-liked, Antipas had him imprisoned at Matras, 
The fortress stronghold his father Herod had built many decades before, on the east side of the Jordan, in the region of so-called Babylon. When Jesus arrived back in Nazareth, and because Joseph was no longer with them, Mary asked Jesus, as her eldest son, to escort her to a wedding she had been invited to in Cana. And Jesus, having lived his entire life on waterways of every type, set out for the wedding with his mother Mary, where he would use his skills to enhance the water into wine. And soon word of this event, performed by this very different man, spread quickly throughout the region, but most especially among the multitude who were the most outspoken critics of the Romans, and who had taken refuge in and about the old fortress-like docks built centuries before on the slopes of Mount Carmel. But when Jesus returned to Nazareth, he was stunned by the news that Antipas had beheaded John the Baptist, the son of one of his mother's dearest friends, and for no other reason than the young girl whom he lusted for had asked him to. The thought of John's head being delivered on a platter to Antipas and to his demonic maiden would prove to be yet another major turning point in Jesus' life. And to reflect on John's memory, his kindly manner, and the ensuing baptism pledge he had made, Jesus went off alone to a desolate spot so he could focus his plan. When he returned to Nazareth, and for the first time since arriving in Galilee, he began speaking out against the rampant injustices being brutally imposed on the meek by those who sought only power and influence by accumulating wealth they had not earned. It was a vicious cycle, and it was being operated by a vicious regime, whose members easily plotted and murdered without fear of reprisal. It was extortion by intimidation, and it was wrong, and he said so. But for this reason the people of Nazareth became frightened by his words and his presence believing his sermons would only bring more harm to their already impoverished community. So Jesus, in consideration of their feelings, and because Antipas controlled all of Galilee, set out for Capernaum, where the less afraid had already formed a coalition, especially on the nearby slopes of Mount Carmel. And as Jesus, driven by his passion and his principles, made his way along the shoreline of the sea, he stopped and called out to Simon and Andrew, who were out fishing from their boat. And then further along he did the same when he encountered James and John, who were mending their nets with their father Zebedee. And when he passed through Bethsaida, he had also been joined by Philip. And arriving with his companions, Jesus soon began sharing his thoughts with all those who came to hear him speak in the various synagogues of Capernaum, whose ruins can still be seen today in the region now known as Caranus a Greek term, which literally means the Lord's Town. But Jesus didn't restrict his message of passive resistance to the synagogues of Capernaum, but instead he traversed all of Galilee, where he delivered his sermons at every local gathering point. And for the first time, for as long as anyone could remember, the people of Galilee were becoming less and less afraid and more and more hopeful that the oppression could be resolved without further conflict, but only if it was championed in the right way. And as Jesus moved from one place to another, the fame of his deeds, his words, his manner, and his extraordinary countenance began to spread among the travelers, who in turn carried the news of this man and his message to all the adjoining regions, and soon great crowds of people came from all around to hear his voice and to see him for themselves. But as his reputation as a healer also continued to spread throughout the distant communities, the sick were brought to him in great numbers as well, and the crowds grew steadily larger, until Jesus, overwhelmed by the constant outpouring of emotion, would often leave in the early morning darkness and go off into the wilderness to heal himself as well. But in time these sojourns into the desert were also discovered, and Jesus found it increasingly difficult to find any place where he could be alone to reflect on his own most innermost thoughts. And it became an increasingly common occurrence that whenever he returned to the shoreline, or walked among the villages, he was mobbed by the crowds who always followed him wherever he went, their voices calling out, their hands reaching out, until the only thing he could do in so many cases was to retreat to the shore. <laughs> 
where he would get into a boat and, pushing off, would speak to the masses as he floated along the beaches of Galilee. However, because his principal companions were mariners, and because he too was a master sailor, having lived his entire life on and along the various waterways of the world, Jesus began to spend more of his time sailing away from the crowds to refresh himself and to meditate, but only for the sole purpose of returning to them with a sound mind and body. But on one particular day, after the crowd had forced Jesus to retreat to the waterline, despite the best protective efforts of his companions who had gathered around him, they again found themselves with no other choice but to seek refuge in a boat. And setting out from Capernaum, they sailed twelve miles to the opposite shore, where Jesus selected certain members from those who had accompanied him on that particular day, and he led them up into the mountain, where he made them his principal disciples. And when they came down, they returned to Capernaum with a greater understanding and purpose. However, on the day Mary arrived in Capernaum, along with Jesus' brothers and sisters, they couldn't get through the crowd of people, but could only hear Jesus speaking to the masses as he floated just offshore. And then Jesus and the disciples sailed away and landed in the district of Genesaret, where Jesus left his companions on the shore and went by himself, alone, up into the mountain. When he returned, Jesus had his disciples cast their nets into the water to feed all those who had congregated there on the shore, in anticipation of his return. And soon thereafter, Jesus retreated to the boat, and after speaking to the crowd who was standing on the shore, they returned to Capernaum. But not to be deterred in their quest to see Jesus' exceptionally different countenance for themselves, and to hear his voice, and to gain hope and inspiration from his words, Many of the local fishermen, along with their families, had now begun to follow Jesus' frequently watery excursions in their own boats. For this reason, Jesus, in his need to find solace, to rejuvenate his own spirit, made plans to set out on the longest journey of all, because not even the stoutest mariner would ever attempt a trip of that magnitude at that time of the year. But Jesus made his preparations, and along with his reluctant disciples, who as experienced mariners themselves knew only too well the perils they faced. But even so, they set out for the district of Gerasene. But the 35-mile journey was the longest one the Sea of Galilee had to offer. And on the way, Jesus had fallen asleep, but was suddenly awakened by the frantic voices of his disciples, who instantly realized their greatest fear had become a reality. The dreaded winds spawned in the desert at this particular time of the year had swept in alongside the mountain of Carmel and were now being channeled directly into the Galil Depression where it was creating huge white-capped waves. And now their heavily laden boat swung uncontrollably into the tempest. With the wind on its broadside it was listing precariously into the surging waves and was quickly taking on water over its lowermost side. But Jesus, who was the most experienced open water sailor among them, had prepared for just such an event, and as he poured the kegs of oil into the water, the sea all around their boat suddenly became calm and still. As they drew nearer to the district of Gerasene, a solitary man who had been tracking their approach for a long while from his lofty vantage point on the top of the sheer cliffs, came down to the beach where he intended to confront these intruders. But when he saw Jesus' uncommon countenance, he became instantly frightened, and recoiling away, he waved his shovel in a most threatening manner. But at that very moment, as Jesus stretched out his hand to rid him of his fears, a herd of hogs, that had been rooting high above them at the very top of the nearby cliff, rushed over the edge, and plunged down into the water below, where the entire herd drowned. And while still frozen in his defensive stance, after witnessing this phenomenal event, and seeing the disciples gather around Jesus in a most protective way, and hearing Jesus' voice, and seeing his remarkably different countenance, the man suddenly realized he was in the presence of someone very special, and who obviously had remarkable powers of influence. And so his demeanor softened, and his agitation, his fear, and his threatening stance suddenly disappeared. 
and soon thereafter the man rushed off to report this miraculous event to the people living in the nearby Ten Towns district of Decapolis. When the respite had ended, Jesus and his disciples returned to Capernaum, and together they went out among the various branches of laborers and their oppressed families, where they continued to deliver their message of strength in numbers through passive resistance, and their mission to keenly unite them into a single and unwavering spiritual power. And as their message and their mission continued to gather momentum, it began having a profound effect on the powerful political and priestly coalitions based in Jerusalem since the commodities they had so long depended on to build their wealth and to retain their power was diminishing in both substance and quantity by the day. But just as worrisome to the priesthood, long before corrupted by Herod the Great, was the stock realization that the people of Galilee no longer believed in their connection to the divine powers, and so the people were no longer abiding by their instructions to fully comply with the mandates of the Roman state which were doctrines completely contrary to the spiritual words preached by Jesus and his disciples. But now the priests, made wealthy by their crafty alliance with the Romans, found themselves being ridiculed on a daily basis, and now more than ever were being viewed not as spiritual guides, but rather as political collaborators disguised in priestly garments. And knowing if they lost their ability to keep control over commerce-rich Galilee, they would also lose their lucrative alliance with the Romans as well. And so they called for a great meeting to determine just exactly what they must do to stop Jesus and his congregation from spreading their word. However, unbeknownst to them, Jesus would never forget the despicable injustices suffered by his kindly friend John the Baptist, when the corrupted priests of Jerusalem never once spoke up on his behalf, nor did they ever speak out against the atrocity John had suffered. But instead, they had chosen to remain craftily silent about the entire affair, since it was in their best interest to do so. When the travelers heard Jesus had returned to Capernaum, the camps emptied out, and he was quickly mobbed by his admirers. Among the crowd were Mary and Jesus' siblings, but yet again they were not able to get close to Jesus. However, when Jesus discovered they had come to Capernaum, he sent for them. And amid the bustle of the crowd, Jesus took them down to the shore. And getting into their boats, Jesus left Capernaum, and along with the disciples, took them all back to Nazareth. And while they were there, Jesus, his disciples, and his brother James used the opportunity to preach among the villages of the surrounding countryside. While at the same moment in Jerusalem, the news of his notoriety had become the frequent topic of conversation not only among the priestly hierarchy and the political circles, but his message was also reaching the commoners who lived there as well. And as this movement gained momentum and the news of Jesus' vast powers continued to spread, it eventually reached the ears of Antipas, who was living on the east bank of the Jordan River in the region of Perea. And when he discovered for himself Jesus' birthright, his uncanny influence over mind, body, and soul, Antipas became very much frightened with the prospect that Jesus was the embodiment of John the Baptist who had come back to haunt him. But by now, because the Romans had begun to move more forces into the area surrounding Galilee, Jesus and the disciples knew their presence only imperiled the people who lived there. For this reason, it was necessary to remain vigilant and to stay one step ahead. And so the disciples, who were always armed, unless they had been instructed otherwise, left Nazareth with Jesus, and they set out for the protective confines of the opposite shore. But when they arrived in the desolate spot, hungry and tired, they were taken by surprise when a crowd of people came toward them from the nearby Grecian colony of Ptolemaeus, bringing with them a small boy who gave them the bread he was carrying, which they shared with all the others before Jesus and the disciples returned to their boats. And as they floated out and away in search of an even more desolate spot, where they could discuss their plight without any interruptions, Jesus spoke to the gathering, and then they were gone. After they had shared their concerns, and with a deep yearning to be alone with just his own thoughts, and to rejuvenate his spirit, Jesus encouraged the disciples, who were his constant companions, to return to their home port at Bethsaida, 
so they could spend time with their own families. But just as importantly, in doing so, they were to gather the most recent news with a plan to meet up again at the isolated island of Genesaret at the designated time. So Jesus went up into the mountains alone, and the disciples departed for Bethsaida. When he came down from the mountain, Jesus set out for the security of the island of Genesaret, where he was to rendezvous with the disciples. However, as he waited for their arrival, a thick fog with a heavy rain engulfed the island and blanketed the sea. Standing on the shore, Jesus heard the disciples calling out as they struggled against the blinding conditions in their errant search for the tiny island. Hearing their familiar voices, Jesus waded out into the storm. And coming up alongside their boat, he gripped it with his firm hands, astonishing the disciples by his sudden and unexpected appearance, whose misty silhouette seemed to be virtually walking upon the surface of the water, and whose ghost-like apparition peered in at them, even though they were five miles out on the Sea of Galilee. After the storm had passed, the disciples informed Jesus that a contingent of priests from Jerusalem, escorted by even more Roman soldiers, had just arrived in Capernaum, and were about to begin an intensive search for his whereabouts. So they quickly left the island, and under the cover of night landed on the beach of Genesa, where Jesus, uncharacteristically becoming an inconspicuous solitary figure who would not draw any attention, immediately set out for the desolate region of Sidon to begin a 50-mile trek to the now high-and-dry borderline of Tyre, a district that had long ago been established on the shoreline marked by the ancient sea. Leaving on his journey just days before the Roman patrols sealed off the northern routes in the region, where the growing ranks of the most outspoken critics of the Romans, and who are regarded by many to be among the most earnest supporters of Jesus, had taken refuge and were now living in and around the formidable and fortified mountainous confines of the Watchtower District. In the meantime, the disciples, making it a point to reveal Jesus was not with them, lingered there for a while in order to further thwart and confound the covert efforts of the Romans and the priests from finding him. But soon after establishing this fact, the disciples departed on an extreme journey sailing along the shoreline to the remotely located Ten Towns District, where they would once again reunite with Jesus, with the expectation that by the time they met again, the fruitless search for Jesus along the northern shoreline would have come to a frustrated end, since it was well known that the unpopular priest never remained in the area any longer than was absolutely necessary. However, the early arrival of the disciples at the Ten Towns District had been detected, and a small crowd of people were also waiting when Jesus walked into the camp. And after sharing their food and freshly caught fish with them, Jesus and the disciples set out for Dalmanutha, where they could discuss their latest strategy in a more private setting. Then several days later, after they had concluded their deliberations, they left for Bethsaida, where many of the disciples had family and where seventy of their most loyal compatriots were waiting, so Jesus could properly bid them farewell. But soon after their meeting, because the Romans, along with their mercenary agents hired by the priests of Jerusalem, were still prowling all throughout the area, and not wishing to bring any harm to the people of Bethsaida if his presence among them was detected, Jesus and a select number of his disciples immediately crossed over to the massive geologic formation they called the Watchtower because of its protectively unobstructed view of both the land and the sea, a fortified hill where the greatest number of their most dedicated and staunchest loyalists lived in the many caves they had honeycombed into its side. But despite their unannounced and sudden arrival at the watchtower, a crowd quickly gathered, and for five days Jesus spoke to them in the sincerest of ways. But on the sixth day he took Peter, James, and John up into the mountain where he revealed to them his innermost being and explained to them just what the future would bring. But with the news that skirmishes with the Roman military were breaking out at so many locations throughout all of Galilee, and not wishing to jeopardize the well-being of those who had taken refuge in the watchtower, 
should his presence there be detected, Jesus and the disciples prudently set out for Magadan to find out for themselves if what they were also hearing about that part of Galilee also being sealed off was indeed true. From Magadan, they covertly journeyed into the provincial region of Roman-held Caesarea Philippi, where they soon heard that Pontius Pilate, the new Roman prefect in Jerusalem, in his quest to send a message, had recently authorized the butchering of 13 people from Galilee. After gaining this news directly from their area resources, Jesus confided in his companions, and he told them again just what he had to do to prevent any more atrocities from happening. Since it was he who the politicians and the corrupted priesthood of Jerusalem were really seeking out, simply because of his popularity, since Jesus, the greatest of all humanitarians, had always preached restraint and had never resorted to inciting violence. And even though the disciples were against it, Jesus had already decided he would go to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, where he would walk unafraid among the masses. But first, he would return to his adopted hometown, where he would speak to his congregation for the last time. And so they secretly made their way back to Capernaum. They arrived in Capernaum undetected, but it was not long before a sudden surge of activity alerted the Roman-sponsored tax collectors, who quickly reacted by confronting Jesus, insisting he pay a tax, expecting he would not oblige them so they could order his arrest with probable cause. But Jesus didn't fall victim to their ploy, but instead he sent Peter to quickly fetch a fish and a coin to satisfy his debt, and shortly thereafter, under the cover of darkness, they left Capernaum. Going by way of the forested areas, they made a wide berth between and around the Roman camps, circling around and doubling back, to re-enter the west bank of the Jordan River at the border of Galilee and Samaria. And by the time Jesus and the disciples had reached Jericho, they had been joined by a great crowd of followers, many of them from Galilee, who were also marching along on their way to Jerusalem in a show of solidarity. However, in tribute to the memory of John the Baptist, Jesus bypassed Jerusalem and, being both emotionally and physically exhausted, went directly to Bethany on the fringes of the Mount of Olives, to the same place where he had pledged himself to do only what was right, just before John had plunged him deep into the floodwaters of the Jerhon, which served as a symbolic reminder of the floodwaters that had destroyed the wicked and the corrupt in Noah's time. But this very particular day was the spring equinox, when both the day and the night were of equal lengths, and the floodwaters of the Jerhon would not be arriving here for another four months. So Jesus and the disciples made their camp at Bethany, where they all settled down to reflect deeply on the moment. At daybreak the next morning, Jesus sat in quiet contemplation as the rising sun lit up the northern face of Solomon's monument for the first time in six months, to herald the arrival of the first full day of spring and the beginning of the premier sailing season in this part of the world, just as his maritime ancestors had designed it to do, and just as many believed it would continue to do for all eternity. And on this very special Sunday, Jesus and the disciples left the Mount of Olives, and they set out for nearby Jerusalem. But as they drew nearer, the emotion and physical exhaustion was taking its toll, and Jesus began to cry. But in anticipation of this possibility, since they knew what was in his heart, the disciples had provided Jesus with a sure-footed mount, and when his followers, who had been forced to make their own camps in the very rough terrain leading up to Jerusalem, saw him in distress, they laid palm branches along the rugged path to fill the gaps and to smooth the way. When they arrived in Jerusalem, the disciples were awestruck by the magnitude of the monuments they had never before seen, having always stayed away because of their intense dislike for both the Roman occupiers and the corrupt priesthood, who had made this place their center of operations, much to the chagrin of those who fully understand its purpose and its history. But as they toured Jerusalem, 
along with the crowd. They were under constant surveillance by the Roman soldiers, Herod's own agents, and the spies who plied the crowd on behalf of the priesthood. Even so, as they moved through Jerusalem, the disciples continued to be amazed and awestruck by the remarkable size and grandeur exhibited in both the monuments and the walls. But even though Jesus agreed with their sentiments, he informed them that because they had been made by the hand of man, they could be easily brought to ruin if the greatest power willed it, and then went on to tell them that their ruin could even happen very soon. And as his words filtered outward through the crowds gathered there among the towering monuments, there was a great deal of hushed wonderment at what he had said. While amongst the ranks of the Roman soldiers, a boisterous demonstration broke out, their words of incredulous disbelief openly scoffing at the possibility that such an event could ever take place. While off to the side, the priesthood, long ago corrupted by Herod, narrowed their eyes, their focus, and they began to hone their plan. That same night Jesus slept on the Mount of Olives, but returned to Jerusalem the next day. And as he made his way into the temple square, he became infuriated when he discovered the money changers were using the Passover gathering to ply their craft, converting and lending money to the poor so they could afford to buy back at inflated prices the very same items many of them had produced in Galilee, but had been forced to turn over to the Romans and their friends in the form of a tax. Swindlings and dealings obviously sanctioned by the priests, because they were flagrantly occurring in Monument Square. In a fit of passion, Jesus charged at the tables, and one by one he flung them over, scattering their contents across the ground, surprising even his own disciples in the suddenness of the moment but who reached under their garments to grip both sword and knife, and were ready to defend him. However, because of the size of the crowd, and because the Roman interests were not being directly violated, the soldiers didn't intervene, but only stood by and watched this unusual man, with the most remarkably unique countenance they had ever seen, and who had boldly declared the massive stone monuments could soon be lying in ruins, lash out against the arrogant activities of the money changers, whose demise would only affect the treasury boxes of the priests. In the ensuing rage, the Herodian priests summoned a meeting. And over the next four days, after spending their nights on the Mount of Olives, Jesus and the disciples continued to return to Jerusalem to circulate through the Passover crowds and to tour among the extensive fields of above-ground tombs and memorial structures while the priests plotted against Jesus, who was now openly threatening their lucrative operations right under their noses. As a result, they sent a delegation directly to Pontius Pilate, the newly appointed Roman prefect, in an effort to convince him that because of Jesus' popularity with the people of Galilee, that Jesus also posed a threat to Roman interests as well. In that same discourse, the priests went even further to say, Jesus had proclaimed himself to be the son of their God when he predicted the massive monuments could soon be laying in ruins if he ever willed it to be so. And because of his reputation, there were many who firmly believed in his exceptional powers. And for these reasons, Jesus had become a menace to them all. But Pilate, fearing a riot would develop if he should intervene, especially because of the great number of people who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, many of whom, as a public sign of solidarity, had mocked their foreheads with ashes taken from the campfires, made from the dried palm branches they had used to smooth the way for Jesus. So in his deliberations, Pilate had decided to send for Herod's son Antipas, since as the appointed ruler of Galilee, Jesus was in fact his subject, and more his own problem. However, when Antipas arrived in Jerusalem from the district of Perea, located directly across the Jordan River Valley, he was meeting Pilate for the very first time. And when Pilate told him Jesus was staying on the Mount of Olives at Bethany, but was coming to Jerusalem every day, Antipas became afraid again, and expressed his fear that Jesus, whom he had never met, was John the Baptist come back to life to haunt him. 
But because the priests, who had been appointed by Antipas' father, were being so tenacious in their demands to have Jesus killed, Pilate and Antipas decided to have Jesus brought to them so they could question him themselves. When Jesus learned of their intentions, he took his principal disciples, and at supper he instructed them that for their own safety and for the safety and well-being of the masses, they were not to interfere with what was going to take place. And he further told them that when they themselves were being sought out, they were to deny any knowledge of knowing him, because far greater things to come could not happen otherwise. And after hearing his voice of reasoning, his wishes, and his predictions, there was an outpouring of various emotions and questions all around. But Jesus calmed their fears and told them exactly what they must do. However, despite his request that they must preserve themselves, otherwise there would be no one left to carry on his work and to spread their humanitarian message, there were still those among them who found it extremely hard to separate themselves from the well-being of their most remarkably gifted and skilled companion, friend, and longtime mentor. After the supper had concluded, Jesus and the disciples returned to Bethany. But it was a restless period of hushed discussions and sleepless hours. And at dawn, on Sunday morning, one week after he had first arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley. And it was not long after that they had arrived in Gethsemane that the priests sent their agents to get him. But Simon Peter, who was always the most eager to fearlessly engage any threat, was incensed by the indignity. And despite Jesus' instructions that the disciples were not to interfere with any part of what was about to happen, Simon Peter drew his sword and sliced off the ear of one of those who had come to take Jesus away. But Jesus, adhering to his own decree, stepped forward and quelled the altercation. And the agents, not willing to engage any further with the disciples, took Jesus into their custody and they brought him to Pontius Pilate, who together with Antipas was seeing Jesus' remarkable countenance for the very first time and was struck by the aura that his physical presence commanded, and they could not look away. But despite the questions asked of him in the several various languages of that time, Jesus remained stolidly silent, his sun-like eyes burning with a passionate repose that set him apart from any other man they had ever before seen. But when Jesus finally broke his silence, knowing what his fate was going to be in any case, he offered them no reason to detain him. However, the priests, knowing how insightful and wise Jesus was, had prepared for this eventuality and so they had coerced and bribed a multitude of like-minded people to call for the death of Jesus. But Pilate had found no fault with Jesus' demeanor or with his answers. There was no blasphemy to support the priest's allegations. And as he pondered his predicament, Pilate's wife stepped out from the shadows. And as she looked into Jesus' eyes and saw his countenance and felt the air of his physical presence in this foreign land so different from her own, she was gripped by an instinctive feeling of impending doom. And so in a frightened voice, as Jesus peered deep into her soul, she whispered into Pilate's ear, begging him not to do Jesus any harm. And three days later, after several attempts to save Jesus' life, Pilate dipped his hands into the water taken from the Jordan, and he symbolically washed his Roman hands of the entire affair, releasing Jesus to the priests and to the mob they had created for their own benefit, since he found this culture was so convoluted and their religious hierarchy too complex that he decided it was not for him to be involved in this Passover turmoil. Pilate dismissed the priests, and with the same gesture signaled the soldiers to escort them out and beyond his home. And surrounding Jesus, they took him, and when they had gone far enough away, and had reached the base of the embankment leading up to the sprawling cemetery, the soldiers began taunting Jesus, just as the priests had encouraged them to do. Mocking him as the son of their God, they hung a sign around his neck reading, The King of the Jews, 
and stripping him of his clothes and the tassara from his pouch, they commenced to severely beat him until he crumpled to his knees. And then pressing a crown of thorns deep into his long illuminated hair, they wrapped him in a purple robe of royalty as they jeered out loud for everyone to hear, pointing, calling, and gesturing for him to knock down the massive structures just as he had said he could do, so he could save himself. But throughout the entire night, Jesus endured. It was a testament to his faith and to his unshakable resolve to do only what was right, just as he had pledged to do, and just as Enoch had done. But it was also the disciples' most challenging test of faith as well, by not interfering just as they had been instructed, for the sake of greater things to come. It was a heart-wrenching scene as the disciples watched the desecration of this man who never wished to resolve any conflict by inciting harm to anyone. But Jesus knew their mind, felt their presence, and when he looked up at them, there was the utmost compassion, pride, and understanding in his eyes. And through the blood and the pain cast in that tragic moment, he saw them for exactly what they were, the bravest and most ferociously loyal men he had ever known. Men with whom he had laughed and confided, and who had learned the lessons of restraint he had taught them so very well in preparation for this moment, and who now relied on this same inner strength to hold back the other loyalists from interfering, just as they had been asked to do. And there was agony, and there were tears, but above it all was a display of the greatest kind of faith. By dawn, at the very moment when the brilliant light of the morning star appeared in the sky over Jerusalem, the beatings finally came to an agonizing end, and Jesus was visibly weakened in body, but still his will prevailed. And staggering to his feet, they placed a heavy cross on his shoulder, and Jesus valiantly began to struggle forward, the blood and dirt dried and caking, creating a stark contrast against his milky white skin the crowd of people following, the little sign dangling from his neck, while the corrupt called out, jeering, pointing, still insisting he destroy the temple to prove he was the son of their God. But then Jesus fell to his knees. The cross had become too heavy for him to bear, the hill too steep for his beaten body to climb. But because Passover would begin in only twelve hours, with the rising of the full moon, the priest stepped forward and demanded the Roman soldiers do something to hurry the situation along, when at that very moment a robust traveler from Cyrene happened to approach the crowd on his way to Jerusalem for the Passover. The soldiers grabbed him and led him over to Jesus, and for a brief moment their eyes met, and in a compassionate manner Simon from Cyrene lifted the cross and hoisted it to his own shoulder and dragged it up the slope and onto the apex of Mount Zion, to the place they called Golgotha, Skull Hill, the highest point and the most prominent place of public executions, from where both the crucified and the temple structure could be plainly seen. It was here where Jesus was impaled before the executioners tilted the wooden frame and raised it into its final position, between two other freshly executed souls, hanging there for all the world to see as men and women from Galilee, his mother and her supporters, a great many of his seventy disciples, the accusatory priests, their agents and their collaborators, the Roman soldiers and many of the curious-minded gathered on the apex of the mount, sitting, standing, some huddling together, all the while waiting and watching, but then Jesus lifted his head, his long hair stained and matted with his blood, his piercing eyes red, his summoning voice once again clear, when off in the distance, at that very moment he called out. A great cloud conjured up by an unseen force rose up in the blood-colored atmosphere and began its ominous approach. But it was the overwhelming heat that was the first to arrive before the noonday sun was suddenly blotted out by the dreaded Camasine storm. And as Jesus endured the brutal onslaught of blinding dust and sand, driven by the howling winds of spring, 
the ground began to shake so violently that stones inside the temple suddenly began to crack, while bodies spilled from the mastabas in the nearby cemetery, and the massive capstones placed there by Herod's command crashed down, while off in the far distance the harbor built by Herod sunk into the northern sea as the soil beneath liquefied and gave way. As the cowering people on the mound, and all throughout the entire land, soldiers and priests and commoners alike, were filled with a spiritual fear unlike anything they had ever known. Crying out in the darkness of the unrelenting onslaught of hot, howling winds and blinding sand, as the earth continued to heave and quake with the most unimaginable power beneath their feet, until both man and beast had been driven to their knees. But then, at the precise moment when Jesus released his soul from his corporeal body, the storm suddenly subsided. And as the stunned and bewildered masses rose up from the carpet of thick and dust, they wondered out loud to one another, and to no one in particular, about the many miraculous phenomena they had just witnessed. And as the entire countryside made inquiries, word rampantly spread that Jesus of Nazareth had been crucified, and everyone somehow knew nothing would ever be the same again. But in those first moments it was only the fearless disciples who truly understood it had all happened for the sake of greater things to come, just as Jesus had told them. The body of Jesus was pronounced dead by the Roman centurion who lanced Jesus' side. But it was the faithful who took his battered and wind-beaten body from the wooden frame and reverently laid him upon the death shroud that had been made on the shores of the nearby Dead Sea, just to the west of Bethlehem. And because Passover was to begin with the rising of the full moon, which was only hours away, the faithful were given permission to place the shrouded body of Jesus into a newly made rock tomb, located on the edge of the mount, and not far away. And just as they rolled a stone in front of the tomb where they had placed the body of Jesus, they looked up to heaven, their gaze mesmerized by the ominous appearance of a rare two-horned eclipse they called the beast, projected onto the full moon as it rose into the sky over Jerusalem to signal the beginning of Passover on Friday evening, April 3rd, in the year 33 A.D. The earthly, human, and divine tremors never subsided on that day, and 36 hours later, on Sunday morning, the earth shook violently yet again, and the stone in front of the rock tomb, where the shrouded body of Jesus had been placed, was rolled aside. And when Mary and her compatriot arrived at the tomb with minerals from the nearby Dead Sea to cleanse and wash the badly damaged body of Jesus, and through flickering candlelight peered inside, Jesus was gone. Thirty years after the crucifixion of Jesus, a 26-year-old by the name of Josephus became a prominent leader of the resistance movement in Galilee, which had only intensified in the wake of Jesus' untimely death. But despite his intellectual and wily prowess, Josephus was finally captured and taken prisoner by the Roman general Vespasian and his son Titus, who had gone to Galilee with a resolve to put an end to the smoldering civil disobedience once and for all. Soon after waging war in Galilee, and with their flanks secured, Titus moved directly on to Jerusalem, where Josephus could only watch as Titus' army decimated the city, executed every single person, and then triumphantly carried away all that remained of the temple treasures. And as a result, with the great loss of both life and cultural icons, the muddled and confused history of Jerusalem, and thus the true whereabouts of Mount Scopus, which is otherwise known as Golgotha, a skull hill, became obscured yet again. As a reluctant eyewitness to the complete obliteration of Jerusalem, and as an intellectual who had studied such matters, Josephus instinctively knew the entire history of the region was once again on the brink of being lost to posterity forever. In recognition of this, and having traveled extensively and intimately throughout both Galilee and Jerusalem, Josephus was compelled to write a voluminous memoir 
which he addressed to his like-minded scholarly Greek audience, where among the trove of other critically important facts he preserved were these keen insights concerning the telltale characteristics of Jerusalem. Monobisa sent her bones, as well as those of Azadis, his brother, to Jerusalem, and gave the order they should be buried at the pyramids which their mother had erected. They were three in number, and distant no more than three furlongs from the city of Jerusalem. Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 20, Chapter 4, Paragraph 3. While to the northwest is Mount Scopus, an elevated plain that lies seven furlongs from Jerusalem, from whose enhanced height a view of the temple can be plainly seen. Josephus, Wars of the Jews, Book 2, Chapter 19, Verse 4 and 7, and Book 5, Chapter 2, Verse 3. Now about this time there was a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men who received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had him condemned to the cross, those who loved him did not forsake him, and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct to this day. Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, Chapter 3, Verse 3. Today, in testimony to those tumultuous times, the gate of Vespasian still stands where it was erected nearly 2,000 years ago, right in the midst of the ruined synagogues, where great crowds of people had once gathered together to see and to hear a very special teacher speak in Capernaum, which is otherwise known as Karanis, a Greek term that literally means the Lord's town. The name of Vespasian, along with the name of his son Titus, the invaders of both Galilee and Jerusalem, can still be found right alongside the names of so many other Greek and Roman invaders, benefactors, and scholars, who in each their own quest to gain historical immortality, and as tradition dictated, etched the symbols of their adopted hieroglyphic names into the numerous walls and buildings that span the entire length of the Jurhan River from the most southerly pyramid fields of Moreau and the most northerly pyramid fields of Giza. Adding to the physical, literary, and topographical evidence that is so abundant and so plainly presented that it stands in stark contrast to the unsupported theories proposed by those few untrained men in the 19th century and the events and actions they subsequently inspired in the 20th century as they still continue to do. Today, like the Exodus route taken by Moses, the route taken by Jesus also exhibits the physical and historical elements of that particular era with equal clarity. Evidence is indelible as they are precise in accordance with every eyewitness account concerning the travels, the trials, tribulations, and ultimately, the spiritual power embodied in one single man, whom the hopeful simply knew as Jesus of Nazareth. There are those who write histories because they are committed to writing them for the advantage of posterity alone, drawing the facts out of darkness and into the light. Truth is their only concern, while others choose to pervert the historical truth simply because it is in their own self-interest to do so. Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Preface, Verse 1. The siege of Masada in 73 AD 
was the site of the final obscuration concerning the true whereabouts of Nazareth, Galilee, and Jerusalem. In recognition of this fact, and with the greatest of foresight and diligence, these many collective decimations became both the inspiration and the passion of Josephus, and his monumental effort to preserve this information for posterity, lest all be lost and forgotten. This is the essence of historiography.